grace and peace to everyone here today. It is a, a joy to, to be up here and to be able to share with you. I, I have a quick question for all of you. Can you think back upon a time when, on some of your longest hours that you've ever experienced, where you were under such intense stress and you could not wait until the sun rose that day, or you could not wait until that experience was over. It seemed like the, the pressure was just going to, it was going to get you, it was going to break you, and you were being tested in a moment of resilience. Can any of you think of some of the longest hours you've ever been through? I'm sure all of us have different stories that we can think about. And one of my stories, I, I usually call this the, the longest night of, of my life, one of the longest nights. I was, I was with a team of five, five people. We, I was still in the Air Force, and it was a summer training and we were being taught what is called night navigation. So night navigation is something where th there was a team of five of us and they said, you get one compass, you get one map, one flashlight, and you have to hike seven miles throughout the night and hit a destination. And if you don't get it right, you fail the training, you're done, your summer's over. And all of us were like, you know, this is an intense moment. So it's, it's midnight, and, and they split you into different teams. And I'll never forget this. And they said, oh, by the way, if we see you with your flashlight, it, you're dead. The enemy got you. You're not allowed to use like a flashlight in the night. So we had a map. We had a compass. And it just so happened that the, this training fell on a night where there was no moon. <laughs> so it was one of the darkest nights in, the, in all of the training, they said. And it was terrifying. It was like every step that we took, they sent us through these deep forests. And the, the, the silence was so eerie that you would step, you know when you step on a stick and it's like, and you think that someone can, can hear you for miles and miles and miles. And luckily, there's one person in our group who was an Eagle Scout. Does everyone know what, a, what an Eagle Scout was? And he had been through some intense training with night nav. And the way that it works is you take out your compass and you, you set your bearing and you, there's this little mark that's glow, that's glow in the dark and you can pull it out at night and you can hold your compass. And even though you can't see anything around you, like nothing, all you can do is hear the person in front of you. You know, I knew that the, the person in front had this compass and he knew, he knew what was going on. And he was, he was stick, sticking on the bearing and he was saying, all right, all of us had to count the number of steps we were taking so we knew the exact distance we had traveled. And um, every, every moment, every step, we, we like, every moment you thought you were gonna fall off a cliff. Cause you, we, you could literally not see a single thing in front of you. It was so intense. And every, every five minutes felt like an hour. And throughout it, we would pause and he would say, all right, we're going to pause. We need to check if we're on course. So everyone, t everyone pause. Does everyone know? Is everyone okay? Is everyone on bearing? And we were, we were all on par. We were terrified. It was so scary. But he said, I'm, I'm sticking with what I know. All I know is my bearing. All I know is my compass. I can't see anything, but I've been trained. I have a checklist. And for me, and for me following and everyone there, we had this intense confidence in him. It was, it was really crazy that he said, I'm going to go through my checklist over and over in this moment of intenseness. And I'm going to check, am, am I on course? Have I plotted the route? And today, I want to ask you, in the moments of your greatest struggles in the moments that you will go through these, these really intense uh, moments in your life, do you have a checklist that you can pause and ask yourself, am I on course? Or what's also terrifying about night navigation, if you get off course and you don't check every once in a while, it's almost impossible to get back and to know where you are when you look at the map. Almost impossible. Hardly nobody can make it. 
And so I want to ask you, do you have your checklist? Are you ready to ask yourself the hard questions about what are my rituals? What are my habits? There's a man named Will Durant, and he said, you are what you repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Have we set our habits straight that we can check back on all these little moments? I think it's safe to say that all of us have our moments of night navigation. I don't, I don't know what they are in your lives. Maybe it's, maybe it's giving birth as a mother. Maybe it's having children as a parent. Maybe it's moving to a new place. But do you have these moments by yourself where you can pause, you can gather yourself, and you can, you can check your, the course of your, of your life? And today, I'm going to present a, a story in 1 Samuel where I think we see someone who doesn't have a checklist. And I hope that we can learn from him and ask ourselves five questions to make sure that we're heading in the right direction, to make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of those who have walked before us. So let, let's, let's pray for, for a moment. Father, I am so, so grateful to, to be here today. Father, as I, as I look about, about um, and see all these faces, and I, I pray that in each of, each of everyone's lives that we're all going through something different, I pray that we would turn to the truth, turn to what we know, Lord, turn to your word, turn to your, to your son and his ways to guide us through turbulent waters, to help us navigate um, life's difficult moments. And in your son's name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to look at five questions today, and we're going to ask ourselves, how do we navigate through the night? How do we do it? And this is just one story I'm sure you can add on to your checklist. But this is a really sad moment in Israel's history. If you, look, if you remember back in chap chapter 12, Samuel is basically emphasizing the ifs to his people. He's saying, hey, I know that you asked for a king. You replace God himself with a king, but now I'm telling you, if you don't keep following him, things are going to go very wrong. And so there's kind of this moment of hope in chapter 12 where we see that oh, maybe, maybe Israel will be okay, but let's turn to Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 13 and just follow along with me there. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in, in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard that it, it said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight, to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in, in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash into the east of Beth Avon. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, The Philistines will come, now, come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. 
Therefore I felt compelled and made a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be a commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Then Samuel arose and went from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. Saul, Jonathan his son, and the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in, Mich in Michmash. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned onto the road to, to Ophrah, uh, to the land of Shul. Another company turned to the road to Beth Horon, and another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. Now there were no blacksmiths to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears, but all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each, each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his sickle. And the charge for sharpening was a pin for his, for his sickle, and the charge for sharpening was a pin for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes and to set the points of the goads. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither a sword nor spear found in any hand of the people who were with Saul and Jan Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan his son. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. Okay, that was kind of a, a long story, and I hope that I, hope that I, can, I can get at so, sort of the overall narrative here. So we see that back in chapter 10, that I'll, I'll read chapter 10. If you'll turn to chapter 10, verse 8, just a little precursor here to this story that's important. So in chapter 10, verse 8, Sam Samuel says to Saul, You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you, and I'll show you what to do. So some of you, that's kind of what, what uh, Samuel is referring to, that verse, when he says, and he shows up to Saul, he's like, what have you done? Why, why is it that this got out of control? And in chapter, in chapter 12, we saw that Samuel calls him out, calls the Israelites out for asking for a, for a, a king, but he displays this radical candor, um, and he emphasizes the big ifs, like I said before. So many people, they look at this story, and if you remember the beginning of Saul, he was this tall, handsome man. He was uh, basically, like, nobody could stop him. The Lord chose him to be king. He, he sent these donkeys so he could be introduced to Samuel, and he had so much promise. Saul had immense amounts of promise. But what is it that enters into Saul's life in this story that tarnishes his crown, that maybe starts to put a little bit of rust on it. Um, many people present that it's this huge pro problem of pride, that pride creeps into Saul's life. And I would generally agree with that, with that statement. And in, in Proverbs 16, 18, we see that Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Haughty means something that is, you think you're superior or disdainful. So a few months ago in May, Brother Finney gave a great sermon on, on pride and how we can picture it. Does anybody remember what that picture was of how we should think about pride? Anyone was here? What was it? <laughs> A three-headed dog. Three dog, Brother Finney called it a three-headed dog named Cerberus. And that pride actually has these three components to it. Um, does anyone remember what those were? Brother Finney, can you say them again? See, so seeking approval, superiority, and self-sufficiency. So when we start to examine Saul's life and what creeps into his life is everyone kind of acknowledges it's pride, but if we don't have this working definition of what pride is, it's, gonna be, it's kind of easy to just say, oh yeah, pride. Pride creeps in, 
Pride is what actually takes his kingdom away from him. So what were those th- I'm going to ask at each moment of, that Saul exhibits pride in this story, which of those he's exhibiting. So I'll be asking the audience and you'll have to, you'll have to engage with me. So the, the, three, the three heads of pride are self-sufficiency, superiority, and seeking approval. Does everyone have those? All right, so you, you'll have a, a choice of three. So I'm gonna present five questions that we can ask ourselves to examine our route under pressure. And with that example, I'm going to, to try to pull out what elements of this pride Saul is displaying. Many of you know that we can learn a lot about people who have made right, the right decisions, but we can also learn about people who have made the wrong decisions. And in this story, if, if you look at it, I pray that you could examine the mistakes that Saul made and try to apply them to your life moving forward. All right, so the first question that we're gonna build on our checklist that, like the Eagle Scouts, is, is credit going to the right place for wins under pressure? All right, if you look at, if you open your Bibles again and you, you look at verses three and four in chapter 13, we see, we see that for the first time we're introduced to Saul's son, Jonathan, and Jonathan's an amazing character and just, I'll read them again. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. So what's happening here? What, what happened that Saul... So... The, 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 the Israelites are under this moment of duress and Saul's son Jonathan actually takes some initiative and he goes and leads an attack. But then Saul has it proclaimed throughout his people that he, that he was the one that had taken the initiative. So he, he claims the credit for a win when really no credit was, was due to him. So the first question, what elements of pride is Saul displaying out of the three, the three heads of pride? He's seeking approval of the people. Definitely, seeking approval. And, and superiority. And superiority, that's, that's the two that I had out of those two. So the first moment of pride in Saul's life is he fails to take initiative and somebody else steps up and Saul's like, oh good, but he takes, he takes the credit from them. Often, often we see leaders throughout the world bickering for credit. I see it all the time. I'll, I'll give you a great example. Every time that an election happens in the US, there's a transfer of power, and what, what indicator are people usually obsessed with? Uh, unemployment rates. So everybody's always looking at unemployment rates, and they're saying, oh, it was this, this administration or this administration. I just read an article. So right now, the, the, our, our, the country we live in is boasting low unemployment rates. But then you have the previous administration saying, that's a result of all of our policies. And then you see our current administration say, no, 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 you had it all messed up. This unemployment rate is a result of our policies. And you see people are just bickering for where the credit is due. So to examine our pride, are we trying to take credit where credit isn't due? Just ask yourself, our, the first question, is credit for wins going to the right place? This is the first quick question. When you're in moments of pressure, you're gonna experience small wins and far be it from you to kind of take all that credit for yourself. I, uh, I'm gonna go back to the story of night navigation. So I'll tell you the end of the story that my, my group happened to be the only group that passed the entire night. Nobody else made it. It was like an impossible test. And all of us, there were five of us in the group, I knew, all of us knew we would have never made it without this Eagle Scout. We were like, there's not a chance we would have made it. And we, we pulled aside, his, his name was James, and we were like, you're incredible. Like, I can't believe that you got us through that. James looked at us, I'll, I'll never forget this. He actually, he actually first introduced me to the quote that I gave earlier. He said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, 
but a, but, but a habit. And he was basically saying, he's like, I went through this training and I, over and over, I, did, I practiced, it wasn't me, it was just me applying a tried system over and over in the hard moments. That's what the successes do. So he basically, like we were trying to praise him and give him credit and he was like, no, 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 like I just learned this. I knew this was true, I knew this would get us to where we wanted to be. So right then, it's like, man, that's humbling. That's humbling. We, we can't take credit when credit isn't due to us. Have any of you, I'll ask you, has there ever been a moment in your lives where you've tried to take credit for something that wasn't really deserved at all? Yeah, there's a hand being raised. I'll, I'm sure we all have moments. I'll give you one of my favorite stories. So my sister and I, we, we shared a room when we were little and I don't, I, I don't really miss those days, but <laughs> so classically, what is something that you always have to do to your room when you're a kid? Can I get? Clean it? Yeah, clean it. Do you ever have, do any of the children and you have to clean your rooms? Yeah, so one time, so our, our um, we had company coming over and our rooms were towards the front. Everyone would see our rooms. So every time our parents would classically say, you have to clean your rooms. And our rooms were always a mess, always. And I remember one time, my sister refused to clean the room. And I spent like 15 minutes, I was like cleaning everything, I cleaned the whole room. And I wanted, I wanted my dad to come in and see that the room was clean. And he, he stepped in and he said, yeah, it looks good. And he stepped out and I was sitting there like devastated. I was like, he didn't praise me. Like, I just cleaned this room. Like I spent so much time. And it's interesting that why, are, why do we often want to take credit for the things that are already expected of us? It, it, there's, there's a notion that, that we try to seek praise for the basic things, like having a clean room, that doesn't really deserve any amount of credit. And I was like so hurt that, that maybe my, si my, I, my sister would get like equal credit with me. And then I realized like, ah, there's, no one deserves credit here. It's just following the basic rules. And I want you to ask yourselves that continuously when you're under pre pressure. Number one, is credit for wins going to the right place? All right, this leads into the second question. And the second question you should ask yourself from this story is, are your people distressed, trembling, or deserting? Are your people distressed, trembling, or deserting? So let's look at verses five, six, and seven. Five, six, and seven. All right. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Haven, when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for people were distressed. Then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. And as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling, trembling. So here we see Paul or Saul as the commander of his armies. And I'll, I'll give the people some credit. Did you? Did anyone catch? The description of what they were facing. They were facing an enemy that, uh, where, where is it, that looked like sand which is on the seashore in multitude. Is that like a something that you can understand you would be you'd be trembling at? Yeah like all right I'll give them some credit but what what does Saul do? He doesn't he doesn't do anything. He 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 has the life of his men in his hand and he sees that they're literally hiding in every single place they can get at. They're in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and pits. Some translations even say that they were hiding among their sheep. Like that's how scared they were. They were, they were the, the shepherds were like in their sheep flocks and this, you see this leader and he's like, he's supposed to be this great man and he does nothing. He does nothing. And I think this is a question that you should, you should be asking both as a leader and as a, somebody who is following a leader, is are you examining the state of the people around you? 
And are they distressed, trembling, or even deserting? Some of them were running away and Saul wasn't doing anything. He was, he was just pressing on. So this one's a little bit harder, but what element of pride is Saul displaying here where he has a trembling people and doesn't do anything? I would say self-sufficiency, and I would also, I'll, I'm going to argue that here he's showing superiority too, that he's saying, hey, I'm king, like, don't question me, just follow me to the ends of the earth. Um, this point really bothers me, especially in a military sense, because as soon as, if you're in a leader and you're trying to start to treat your people like assets, like they're dispensable, he, he almost stops caring for them. And what, we, what Saul really should have been doing he, is he should have been saying, what am I doing wrong? Like, what am I doing wrong that the people I'm commanding are literally hiding in rocks? I don't even know what that means. I, what I assume is like, they were so afraid and they had no confidence in him. Like, Saul should have been saying like, something is wrong in me that I should be pivoting here. And we don't see that. We don't see that anywhere. And this gets to a question that we as a people of God need to start asking ourselves more often is, uh, Brother Finney have, has talked about this, is are we asking ourselves, how is our crew? Often, we, often when we interact with each other, we say, hey, how are you doing? Or how is your week? How are you as an individual? But we fail to take into account the general state of our people, of our church, of our friends, of our family. And if our family, if those people we care about most, if they're hiding in caves, like that's, that's a telltale sign that something is off with us. So that, that's the second question that we should be asking is are your people, are your people distressed, trembling or deserting? I'll tell one more, I'll tell another story here. I'm gonna draw heavily on my, heavily on my military experience because you, you see leaders and you see really bad leaders. So my sophomore year of college, actually all three years of, of college, we had to have um, our rooms in perfect order. At, we would have to open our doors at 6.30 in the morning. And they would get inspected by a team of college students, fellow college students. But there's a famous there's a infamous uh, person in charge of my squad. He was a helicopter pilot. He had a, a big head. Does everyone know what a big head is? Mm -hmm. it just like shaved. He would, he would put shaving and come on and shave his head every morning. He was big. He was really intimidating. And in order to prepare us for the inspections, he would come in to all of our rooms at 6.30 every morning. Before the, so we would get two inspections. We would get, and nobody else at the entire school had this. He would inspect our rooms before the inspection. So he would come in with this like sheet and he would just like, it was terrifying. Every morning, every morning I remember waking up like, I don't, I don't want to be here. Like I am, like I would be trembling and he'd look at our sink. I'm not, I'll never forget this. I had spent like, I spent like half an hour cleaning my room every morning and he would come in and there's like a spot of toothpaste like underneath like the little sink spigot and he'd be like, not good enough. And he'd like write something down on a piece of paper, hang it on our door frame and walk away. And I remember, I remember thinking that, so there were these hallways in our dorm rooms and whenever he was walking towards anybody, anybody in our whole group, we would turn around and walk to avoid him. Like, we, wa we wanted nothing to do with him. We were terrified. We would run away from him. This is almost like what's, what's happening with Saul here is he fails to understand the state of his crew, and he elevates his own authority above the, that of his people. It's a quick tell when your people are trembling and you don't do something, or you're a follower and you're not trying to change things, that something is terribly, terribly off. The opposite outcome of having a trembling people in the face of danger is, it's kind of hard to get at, but if Saul would have been a great leader, then what would the people have been, been doing as opposed to hiding in rocks? Um, just like the opposite. They would have been behind him, 
rallied strong and saying, I'm ready to die for you. Like, I'm ready to go to the end, no matter what. Like, I trust, I trust that you're actually, you have the compass in your hand and that you can see that glow in the dark dot and you know the route. And I'm ready to, I'm ready to follow you to the end. That's not what we see here, but that's what, that's what we want. That's what we want as followers, and that's what we want in our leaders. The Romans, there, there's a great little pamphlet called, We Don't Speak Great Things, We Live Them. And the early Christians, the Romans were making commentaries about them saying, these Christians would make the best soldiers in the entire world. And do you know why? Like, they're not scared to die. They're not scared of anything. Nothing can, nothing can shake them. And I read that and I was like, wow, like, that's what I want to be described as as a follower. And why is, it that, why is it that we are willing to go to such great lengths to lose our lives for what we believe in? It's at, uh, I think my favorite summary about this is from, many of you have seen the Just War debate and Dean Taylor, he, he uses a small dialogue between Napoleon and a man called, his name is Count Mofalon, to make Jesus' brilliant shine. Brilliant shine, and he says, and this is Napoleon to the Count. Can you tell me who Jesus Christ was? Upon the Count declining to respond, Napoleon countered, well then, I will tell you, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I myself have founded great empires, but upon what did these creations of our genius depend? Upon force. Jesus alone founded his empire on love, and to this very day, millions will die for him. Millions will die for him. And we are part of those people, or we should be. If you look around at your church, if you look around at your friends, can you truly say, is there trembling? Are you scared of something? Or are you, are you back to where the early Christians were, where the government themselves would say, these people, they fear nothing. Like, we should be, we should be scared of them. Do you and your people have a covenant? Are you, are, are you with your leader sitting there saying, hey, I'll, I'll follow you to the end. Like, I trust in you. And is that trust bred from this truth? It should never ever be this one-sided element that we see in Saul here, where he's the leader and he's making decisions, but the people have no confidence in them. This is why in the Garden of Gethsemane, I was thinking about a story that kind of exhibits this well, that the Garden of Gethsemane should ac actually break our hearts because in Jesus is one of Jesus's darkest hours, maybe his longest nights, periodically, what was he doing to go check in on? He was going to check how his people were doing. He was going to, to his disciples. They, they had no idea what was coming. He was about to enter his darkest moment and what was on his heart? He was going back to his disciples and saying, you need to be praying, how are you, like, you need to be praying, this is coming. And in the moments of our darkest hours, are we gonna be doing the same? Are we gonna be going to those who are around us? All right, so I'll just, I'll bring this point, make one more point about our people. When we were doing this night navigation, I think that James had done this before, and I said this in the beginning of the story, but he would stop and he would say, does everyone understand what's going on? Is everyone okay? Is everyone here? Are there any questions? How are you feeling? What are your emotions? He was being like a shepherd to all of us clueless people that couldn't see anything in the back, because he had this truth. But it also goes to show that if you get your sights set on a vision, but you forget who's behind you, like that, that's a sign of, of you kind of losing sight of your people and your flock. Are you being a shepherd here? And I'm gonna be honest here, I would have followed James off a cliff, 100%. And if I would have like been paralyzed, I wouldn't have been mad at him. Like, I would have been like, man, you were doing everything. I know I could trust in you. You were checking in on me in the back and you cared about me. So are we caring about those behind us and around us, just our crew in general? I think this has a lot to do with parents 
with mothers, with anybody in a church, in a family? How, how is the state of our people? He was always, James was saying, how can I help? What can I do better? I'm going to get you through this. But his success was born from caring about his people. If he would have made it alone, um, nothing, nothing would have, um, it would have been success. All right, so this leads us into the third question. And the third question you should be asking in your moments of darkness, in your moments of struggle, are, are you doing what you know you need to do? It's a very simple question, but are you doing what you know you need to do? And I think this ties in very well with what Brother Finney pre presented at Devotions, where he said, there are two types of people. There are those who read God's word and obey it and tremble at it and are humble, and there, there are those who don't. Which, cat, which category are you in among those two? So let's, let's read verses 8 through 10. But remember that, do you remember the, 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 the verse in chapter 10, verse 8? So I'll actually read it one more time before I... So chapter 10, verse 8. Chapter 10, verse 8 of 2 Samuel says, You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. All right, let's fast forward back to chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And it says, Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered before him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. So some of us might be reading this and thinking, like, well, it was Samuel's fault. Like, Samuel waited till the, till the 11th hour to use a, uh, that's, an, that's an American idiom, till the, ele till the 11th hour, till the last moment to come and, and, and present himself to Saul. And Saul's sitting there thinking, he knows exactly what he needs to do, but he goes and he takes matters into his own hands and ignores basically a battle-tested priest in Samuel. So what elements of pride is Saul displaying here? Self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. Perfect answer. Saul knew exactly what he needed to do. He knew the exact time, and he, he loses trust. He loses hope. So he exhibits, once again, an element of pride. When things tend to go wrong, we often seek these grand explanations about why things are going wrong in our life, when really, it's these really basic things that are a simple explanation. Let me give you just a, some, simple ant, some simple examples. I don't feel close to, I don't feel close to God. I can't hear him. I can't, um, I can't get a good devotional in. And then usually we can ask someone, are you abiding with your father in prayer? Are you reading his word? Are you fasting? What is typically the answer people give? Well, no, I don't have time, I'm busy. Should it be any surprise? You're not doing what you know you need to do. Try again. Get back to the basics, the habits of excellence. Here's another one. I'm feeling really de depressed, like I, I don't know what's going on. What, what should you ask someone? Are you in sin? Sometimes people say, yes. Oh, you're in sin. Have you laid out a plan of victory to conquer your sin? And people, people's immediate response tends to be, no, I haven't really thought about how I'm going to conquer this sin. What should we be saying to them? Try again. Go back to the basics. Lay out a plan. What are you going to do to get this out of your life, to stop feeling depressed? It's not that hard. Are you doing what you know you need to be doing? Are you lost in the night? Are you lost in the night? If someone were to ask us, one of the teams that didn't make it during this land nav, ex land nav uh, exercise, they would say, yeah, we're lost. Are you keep All I would have to ask them, are you keeping your bearing? Do you have your compass out? Have you pulled out your map recently? 
Are you counting your steps? Are you going through your checklist? And if they were to say no, all I have to say is try again. You know what you need to be doing. Do the simple things. Do the simple things. Again, I'm going to say the quote again periodically. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellent then is, excellence then is not an act, but a habit. The basics will save your life. They'll save your life in land navigation. They'll save your life spiritually if you're doing the small things. Often, almost always, when somebody is going through like a crisis in their life and they're, they're looking for answers, the answer to number three of are you doing what you know you need to be doing is usually no. They're like, no, I'm not reading my word. No, I'm not spending time with God. Yes, I'm in sin. And so when something, when something goes wrong, it ends up escalating rather than people turning back to the basics. All right, so this leads me to a f the fourth question that, that we should ask when something goes wrong. So the fourth question, if something goes wrong in your life, what is your reaction? That's it. What is your reaction when something goes wrong? There are a lot of ways that we can react when something goes wrong, and these are some of the most telling moments in our lives. So let's look at verses 11 through 14. Verses 11 through 14. What book and chapter? Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come to me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be a commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded. All right, so what, it, what was Saul's first reaction when something went wrong? It, it's in, uh, point it out. It's in verse 11. He, uh, instead of saying, instead of saying, oh, it was on me, what does he do? He says, it was you. <laughs> like, you were late. He, he plays the blame game here, right when something goes wrong. All right, so Saul right here is repeating classically what happens in the garden. He's, he's playing the, game, the blame game. And what element of pride is Saul displaying when something goes wrong that was his own fault, but he points at someone else? Any? I call it superiority. Superiority, yeah. Where you can do no wrong, where something, something is going off course, and you look at someone else and you're like, it was your fault, you did it. And I think that Saul, Samuel's question in, in, verse, in verse 11 is, is really haunting to me. He, it's just a simple question where I can just see Samuel walking up to Saul and just looking at him and saying, what have you done? Samuel, what have you done? Like, I told you what to do. It's written in the word of the God, and you didn't do it. Like, what have you done? Once again, Samuel is hitting on the ifs in the Bible. He's like, if only you would have followed God, then your kingdom would have lasted forever. But now that you didn't, it's not going to be okay. But here, Saul still has a choice to react to this. Saul still has a choice to say, you know what? You're right. Like, I messed up. I need to keep moving forward. But instead, what does he do? He, he, starts to, he starts to defend himself with his superiority, with his pride. He lets his pride get in the way when he's failed to go after, when he's failed to go after what God has done. And I just want to pause just for a second. And when we don't do what is written in God's word, is this our reaction where are, are we approaching people in our lives and we're saying, I didn't go against 
I didn't do what the Bible said. I, I, I messed up. Are we taking sin seriously enough where the people around us, or you're speaking into someone's life and you're saying, what have you done? What are you doing? Like, this is a kingdom crushing moment. This is, this is a moment worthy of you losing an entire kingdom, you losing your life. Are we elevating the, the severity of sin to where it needs to be in our own lives and in the lives of people coming to us for advice and confessing? We need to be, act, we need to be asking ourselves, what's our reaction when we mess up and things start to go wrong? I'm gonna give some other examples of really poor reactions to events when things go wrong. So the first one is running and hiding. Did any of you, when you were little, do something bad and you didn't want your parents to find out so you ran and you hid? Is that just a simple, that was me. So one summer, I was, I was my, my oldest sister, she has two nephews and we were outside and we were at a, we had a grill going and everybody knows, don't touch the grill, it's hot. It's gonna hurt you. But I watched my, one of my, my nephews, his name was Jaden. He was really young. He went up and he grabbed, he grabbed the grill and he was like, I could see him. He was like, ah, it hurt a ton. But he just took off. He just like ran. And I, I was like, I wonder where he's going. So I followed him and he was in his room under the bed, just crying, just like, like he was so ashamed that he had done something wrong, that he had run and he had hid. So that's actually a knee-jerk reaction to when something's going wrong. Sometimes we want to run and hide, and sometimes it, it comes out in different ways in our lives. Some people just like shut down and they stop talking about what's going wrong. Some people, they'll turn to sleep. Some people, they'll turn to laying in bed. But when something goes wrong, what should we actually revert back to? We should be going back to the basics rather than keeping going. So we have, I know that when I get burned, if, if you burn yourself very, very severely, the, the, the advice that was given to me is you run and you stick your hand in water as fast as you can to, to, to make sure that it doesn't keep burning. And if my nephew had done that, I, I got it, his hand in water, he would have been okay. If he could have just reverted to the, ba to the, to the basics, what he knew, what he knew he should have do, needed to do. All right. Another, another classic reaction to, to something going wrong in your life is trying to hide the air itself, that trying to bury it or to toss it under the rug, and you usually just make things worse. So, did anyone, did anyone have a fireplace growing up, or of some sort? Did you have like fire pokers where you could? So one time I was at my house alone and I had a fire going and I had the fire poker in. It was just metal. It had no, no handle. And I touched it. It was really hot, but I dropped it on our wood floor <laughs> and it made this huge burn mark right in the floor. And I was, I was like, so I threw it back in and I was looking and there's just this black mark on our floor and I was alone in my house and I was like, oh no, what do I do? do you, instead of calling my parents and going back to what I knew I needed to do. I went and I got some sandpaper and <laughs> I started trying to rub out the burn mark and I was trying to hide it. And then as I kept going, I was like, this is getting worse. <laughs> this is not getting better. I'm, I'm making things way worse. So then I couldn't, I couldn't get it out. I didn't have the right equipment. My parents come home that night <laughs> and they come in the first thing they, they look down and they're like, what did you do? <laughs> like, why, why did this happen? And I explained, I was like, well, I tried to take it out and I dropped it and it burned and I tried to put it back in and then I wanted to hide it. So I was sanding it down. I didn't want you to find out. My dad just looked at me and he's like, you should have just called me. Like, I would have helped you. I should have just leaned on your father and his knowledge. But sometimes in our pride, in our superiority, we don't want others to know that we've messed up and we actually run away from the basic things in our life that we know we need to be doing. Um, in this, in this um, land navigation story, I'll, I'll add another layer to the story. We actually had radios that um, we could 
we could call in like emergency situations. We ended up, didn't end up losing ours, but there's another team that one of their one of their teammates fell off like this ledge and broke his leg, and he was out in the middle of the night. And all of, all these people, they're thinking the whole team. They're thinking like, what do we do? <laughs> like, if we call in, we're not going to pass. So what they did, they didn't even make it to their destination. The, the trick was that past a certain time, if you weren't there, they sent out like a rescue team to find you. And they waited till the last moment to be rescued. And they didn't call in with their radio and say like, hey, we need help. And that kid, like all my, <laughs> he was in so much pain. And they said that like he almost, something bad could have really, really, really bad could have happened. And what they should have done was just Call out the emergency, sound the alarms, ring it. When you need help, turn to who you know can help you. And in our case, we know when we need help. We know there are wise people around us. All right, so it might have been too late for Saul to undo his mistake. He already made the offering, but he could have repented. Instead, he stands on his pride and he's saying, no, this was your fault, Samuel. You should have come. Stands on his pride which leads into the fifth question in times of pressure, which is, are you alone? So just asking, ask yourself, are you alone? So let's take a look at verse 15. So after this whole fiasco, when, when Saul has already dug himself into a big hole, he's already pushed Samuel away. Then Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. All right, it, this is actually, I was reading some, some commentaries on this book, and one of the authors says that this is the, the saddest moment in the entire story, because when the man who Saul should have been respecting most is riding away, what does he do? He just lets him ride away stands on his pride, and he lets him right away. So what, what element of pride is Saul displaying here when he watches, watches Samuel right away? I would say, I would say self-sufficiency. If I were in Saul's shoes and I saw Samuel walking away, the man who anointed me, the man who discipled me, I would run after him and I'd be like, I would beg him not to leave. I'd be like, help, help me make this right. What, what have I done that, that, the king, that I'm going to lose my kingdom? Instead, what, what does he do? He just watches Samuel leave, this battle-tested priest with, with access to God. He watches him right away. So this is the fifth, the fifth question you should ask. And the moments of pressure, when you look around yourself, and after all is said and done, are you alone? Have, have you pushed people away from you? Have you isolated yourself? And if so, <laughs> it's a clear sign that something has gone terribly, terribly wrong. You shouldn't be alone, neither as a group or as, a, as an individual. If you're running off and you're like, and you, you wanna like stop and pause and you're like, wait a second, we're all alone. There's nobody supporting us. There's nobody here beside us. Stop and pause for a second. If you're alone individually, you're, you're making decisions where nobody is supporting you. It's a clear sign that something is wrong and that you need to course correct. You need to change your route. One of the... Uh, <laughs> Another one of the land nav teams, this, this story is full of good, <laughs> of, of good antidotes. Um, one, of the, one of the members of the team got really frustrated throughout the night and he was in the tail, the tail of the group. That means he was the last person. And he decided that he was just gonna sit down and he was done, he's giving up. And his team didn't know and they, they kept going without him. And in these hours, like I said, there can be hours where you forget to talk to each other because it's dark. And he got separated from his group. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he, I, he, he was telling the story afterwards. And he said, I was, I was in, I'd been laying there for about an hour. And I just said, guys, 
No answer. <laughs> no answer. He had isolated himself. When the group was going the way he needed to, he gave up, he sat there, he just, they left him. He was there all alone. When you're all alone, don't be. <laughs> Go back and find the people that you need to make restitution for. It's funny, I was, I was debating whether or not to tell this story, but have, have any of you ever made a decision where the people you loved most we're telling you not to make that decision and you still made it anytime. So I was a senior, man, I was a senior in high school and there was this, there was this girl that I really, really, really wanted to date. I really wanted to date. I don't even know why. But, and I started dating and there was this moment, my group of my closest friends pulled me aside and they said, Zach, you should not date this girl. Well, she's gonna lead you, she's gonna be a bad influence on your life. And I looked at all of them and I was like, no, <laughs> like, I know what I'm doing. I know what I want. I know my emotions. I know, what, I know what I'm doing. And they said, they looked at me and they said, Zach, we love you, but we don't support you in this. And I was, and they walked away and they said, we've said what we need to say. And they walked away. And that decision ended up causing me more pain, more heartache than one of any other decision in my whole life. So when you're making decisions and you feel alone, or people, the people you love, they're saying, don't do this, like, let me help you do the other thing. Listen to them. Listen to the people around you. Don't watch, don't watch them walk away from you and continue on the path that, you need, that you're going towards. You don't have to be alone. So the fifth question was, are you alone in the moments of darkness when you're feeling intense pressure? Are you alone? And if you are, go back. Go back to the basics. Go back to where you know you need to be. Don't isolate yourself. So in conclusion, if you go back through this story where you think about a moment where you've been under pressure, or if you're under pressure right now, and you answered yes to any of these questions. So if credit for wins was going to the wrong places, if you or your people are distressed, trembling, or deserting, if you stopped doing what you know you need to do, the basics, if you have a poor reaction when something, wrong, something uh, goes wrong, or if you find yourself alone, then sound the alarm, like start pulling out your hair, start, start going back, do something. Don't continue on going down the path you're, you're going on because there, there's actually hope in this. When, when things are starting to feel a little helpless, there is still hope. So the helplessness does not mean hopelessness. I'm gonna, if you read verses 16, the end of the chapter, I'm not gonna read through them. But here we are, and at the end of the chapter, I don't know if you remember it, basically, the Israelites have no weapons, the Philistine have a monopoly on all the metal, they have to go and they have to pay the Philistines to sharpen their, their farming instruments. Like, that is helpless. Like, they, they don't know what to do. Like, they have been led completely astray. But are they hopeless? No. If we continue reading, who do, they, who do they have back, who can they turn back to? There's always a father who is looking at you saying, come back, come back, I'm here to help you. And then if you answered yes to any of those questions, I would also make the case that sometimes the best action is to stop to pause. So in night nav, when you're going off course, do you want to just keep going once you've identified that you're off course? Absolutely not. It's the worst decision you can make. If you answer yes to any of those questions, or you, you, you think you are, don't just do something, stand there. It's, 
Have you ever heard the, the phrase, don't just stand there, do something? Don't just, <laughs> don't just do something, stand there. In the night nav example, what you would do is you would, we would have these little blankets, we'd pull them over and we'd turn on our flashlight and we'd look at the map and be like, where on earth are we? Are we, are we where we need to be? Sometimes the best action is to stop. Just stop, reevaluate. Are you on course? And ask yourself, I would say the third question is really important. Are you doing the simple things? Are you doing the things that you know you need to do before you get into these existential moments of crisis where you think your life is almost at its end or you just can't make it any further? Helplessness is not hopelessness. Don't just do something, stand there. Go back to where you need to be. If you wait too long, you could go way off course. And sometimes there's no turning, there's no getting back. Look, luckily, this, this land navigation example was an exercise. But if it would have been real life, the people who just kept doing the things they know they shouldn't be doing, they would have never made it back. Their lives would have been forfeit. They would have been captured by the enemy. They would have been killed. And they wouldn't have made it to the end. You are what you are repeatedly do. Do you have a checklist that will save your life? But not only your life, your crew's life. Get that checklist.